In this video, we are going to take a look at four different separation techniques that use some of the principles of intermolecular forces to separate different types of compounds. So to kind of start off here, uh, we're just going to list out the four different separation techniques. So we're going to look at distillation, then we're going to look at solvation, filtration, and evaporation. Then we'll look at recrystallization and finally chromatography. Let's start with distillation. So distillation is a process that's used to separate a homogeneous mixture of two miscible liquids. So um, the, the kind of key point here is that one of the liquids has to have a lower boiling point than the other liquid. And this is based on intermolecular forces. So if you were to set up this apparatus, so what you would do is you'd put your sample in here. So you'd have a sample of say uh, this liquid along with this liquid in here. Okay, it would all be mixed together. It'd be homogeneous. You wouldn't see the separation, but I just want to kind of show you the two different colors and say, for example, the blue is a lower boiling point than the red. As you provide heat here, so our heat will come from something like a Bunsen burner that's heating up the bottom of this round bottom flask. Um, eventually the mixture will get heated up where the blue will um, boil and become a vapor. And so it'll come up here depending on the temperature and eventually it'll come down our condenser tube here. And we keep our condenser tube really cold by um, having cold water coming in and, and out that's wrapped around this condenser tube so that as the vapor comes into this, it condenses back into a liquid and drops down into the beaker here, uh, which is going to then just bring our blue liquid here, keeping the red liquid separated. So this is a way to separate two different liquids that have different boiling points but are a homogeneous mixture. The second method of solvation, filtration, and evaporation is used to separate two solids based on intermolecular forces. So if, for example, we have a sample, say we have sand and sugar in here, um, we can separate that because one of the components is going to be soluble in water or some other solvent and the other one's going to be insoluble in water. So if we had, say, sand and uh, sugar, the sugar is going to be soluble in water whereas the sand is not. So what we can do is we can add water or we can add some other solvent in here. The sugar will become solvated or dissolved, uh, whereas the sand is going to stay in its solid form because it's insoluble in water. Once we've uh, solvated that, we can then put this uh, sample through a filter. And what we'll see and what we'll collect is we'll co collect the insoluble in the filter and then the water... Um, or our solvent with our other thing dissolved in it. So in this case, the sugar will go through our filter and then we can finally evaporate it by putting some heat underneath this liquid sample. The water is going to evaporate, eventually leaving us with our solid sugar. So we can get our solid sugar here and our solid sand in this particular step. Recrystallization is our third method, and this is kind of similar to the last one we looked at, except in this case, usually what we're doing is we're trying to separate a solid product from impurities in a chemical reaction. So this is called uh, recrystallization. And what's going to happen here is our desired product is going to be less soluble uh, in a solvent compared to the impurities. So if we were to take our sample and we then dissolved it in some hot solvent, so that's why our little thermometer here is all the way up because this is going to be hot, it's going to create a saturated solution. And then what we do is then we cool the solution down 
so that our desired product recrystallizes, whereas the uh, impurities will stay in solution here because they're more soluble. And then once we've done that, we can filter and collect our product. So this is our desired product here, and then this is all the impurities um, in our sample here. So nice way to get some of those impurities out of a sample. And then the last method is chromatography. There are a few couple of types. So we're gonna talk about paper chromatography first and it's set up. Essentially what we do is we have a container that has a very am small amount of solvent. So this could be something that's polar, could be something that's non-polar. It depends what sort of uh, separation we're kind of going for. Um, and then what we do is we take this chromatography paper here, we draw a pencil line because um, our pencil is not going to dissolve in our solvent as it's coming up. If we used a pen, it could dissolve and it could start going up and mess up our samples. So we definitely don't want to do that. And then we add in a sample spot on that pencil line that's going to contain a couple of different compounds. So compound A and compound B, for example. Now, uh, once we, we have our paper chromatography set up, we allow it to run. So when we place it in the solvent, the solvent's going to travel up the paper. And so the substances A and B are in the mixture may have different affinities for the solvent, which the solvent we call the mobile phase. So the solvent is the mobile phase, whereas the paper is our stationary phase. So stationary phase. And so the affinity for either the mobile phase, the solvent or the paper, the stationary phase is going to depend on the intermolecular forces of attraction between the substances and the solvent or the paper. So depending on if it is more uh, forces of attraction or affinity for the mobile phase, it's going to travel up further. And if it has more affinity for the stationary phase, it won't travel as far. So if your solvent was polar, the more polar compounds are going to have more affinity for that, so it's going to travel further. If your solvent was nonpolar, then the more nonpolar components are going to travel further because they're going to be more soluble in that uh, solvent itself. So depending on the affinity, it's going to depend on how far they travel. So what's really nice about paper chromatography is we can get some different calculation values from our particular chromatogram. So we take our pencil line where we started and then once we're done we also mark our solvent front and then we can use these distances and the distances that are uh, different spots move to calculate something called the retardation factor or RF. So RF is the distance um, that the spot traveled over the distance of our solvent front. So our solvent front. And then there's lots of data for different literature values that can be used and we can compare those to the same uh, the same spots and as long as the, the same mobile and stationary phases were used and we can use those values then to try and identify different spots. So for example, if we were doing the calculation for the RF um, for spot B, we would do our six centimeters that it traveled and we would divide that by 10 centimeters. So that gives us an RF of 0.6 um, and then we could do the same for A, and that one is 8 centimeters over 10 centimeters, um, or 0 0.80. Okay, so A traveled further, it has a higher RF value. Now finally, one thing to note is that there is a type of other type of kind of chromatography Actually, there's lots of types of chromatography, but one very similar to paper chromatography that is um, a little bit better in terms of resolution is called thin layer chromatography or TLC. 
And so what makes this different is you have uh, this plate. It's either usually glass, but it could be metal or plastic. And it's coated with a very thin layer of either um, SiO2, which is silicone dioxide, also called silica, um, or it could be uh, coated with aluminum oxide, so Al2O3, which is also known as alumina. Um, so we can do this. The, the downside is it is more expensive because it does cost more to create materials this way. Um, typically what you do is you use nonpolar solvents so that the nonpolar compounds are going to travel further up the plate and then the polar ones are going to stick to the silica or the alumina more. So it gives better resolution but is and, and it's got greater sensitivity but it is more expensive. So there are pros and cons to using TLC. So those are the four different methods we can use to separate different compounds based on their intermolecular forces. That's it then for this video. We'll see you in the next one.